Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I'm your host, Kat Kinsman, Senior Editor at Food & Wine, and my guest today is Angie Marr. She is the chef owner of the Beatrice Inn in New York City. She's a Food & Wine Best New Chef, Class of 2017, and author of the upcoming Butcher and Beast. I wanted to talk to Angie because she's been a friend for a while and an inspiration uh, for just as long. I greatly admire her business acumen, the way that she mentors her, uh, her, her staff and the people around her, her innovation in the kitchen. And we sat down and talked about some of the realities of running a restaurant like she does, of leaving a six-figure salary to take a chance and live on a line cook's wage, and some of the, the risks and rewards of being a bold person in the food industry. Come sit down with us for a while. Welcome to Communal Table. I am so excited to have one of not just a chef who I adore in today, but somebody who has become a friend and who I admire on a billion different levels, Angie Marr from the Beatrice Inn. Thanks for having me, Kat. Oh, it's such a treat. <laughs> um, we're just like, let's talk about how we actually met. We, we've known each other for a while. Yeah. So, um, Let's see. I knew that we were going to be friends immediately because you were sitting at my bar. At the end of that bar. At the end of the bar. We've sat many times. um, And you were having this chat with my bartenders and they were like, you have to meet this woman. She's amazing. I don't think they knew that you were in the industry at that point. Yeah, I hadn't said anything. um, But they were like, she has a tattoo of bone marrow. (laughs) And I was like, well, then she is a woman after my own heart and we will be friends. And I think that at that point I just decided that that this was going to happen. It was, we, uh, my husband and I came in, I had been in for a drink once before. I had, frankly, sort of before your tenure, thought about the Beatrice Inn as like kind of a douchey place. As it was. I'm really sorry. (laughs) But I mean, it has a long history. It's been through, uh, for people who are listening who do not know about the Beatrice Inn, it has been around for how many decades? I mean, it's been around since the 1920s. It was one of New York's first speakeasies. Um, you know, it was an Italian restaurant for over 50 years. Yeah. And uh, then a nightclub, one of the most notorious nightclubs in the 2000s. I've heard the words Coke Den. Yes. To it. <laughs> and I, don't, I thought of it as this sort of, you know, glam place and things. Yeah. But I was uh, going to a party and I had a couple of friends with me and we realized, oh, wow, the party doesn't start for another hour. Let's go get a drink. Mm-hmm. And I remember coming in. <clears throat> getting my favorite drink at Friend 75 and realizing like this drink is amazing the bartender is lovely this is not douchey at all <laughs> <laughs> so then my husband and I were going to see a play nearby and it was the night before his birthday and we sat at that bar and your bartenders were speaking of you with tremendous love in a way that could not be coached that could <laughs> not but like just with deep admiration and and then the food started coming out and I still remember that I got the um the aged burger which yeah. uh, we're going to talk about in a sec and my husband got this milk braised uh, pork shoulder and we're like we didn't know who the chef was we just knew this this meal was incredible and the drinks were phenomenal uh, sort of very they made their presence known yeah. in a really <laughs> wonderful and important way I think we asked your bartender out to a party we were going to the next yeah. day um, and they kept talking about chef chef and then this woman comes walking out of the kitchen I was like that is the chef oh my goodness I mean I hate I, I hate getting gendered about food I, it's one of my least. Me too. Yeah, it's it's yeah. really one of my least favorite things. But I was, it made me so happy that a woman was cooking this very meaty, big, uh, present, unapologetic food. And I called the next day um, to try to set up a photo shoot for where I was working at the time. So. Yeah. I remember. Yeah, it was so great. Yeah. So at the time, you didn't own the place. Didn't own the place Let's yet. Let's talk about that yeah. journey. Yeah. Um, well, Graydon Carter was the owner of the restaurant at the time. And um, I had taken over the kitchen there after it had had multiple chefs um, and not a very high success rate in the times. There had been a rather yeah. notorious review. And the yeah. thing is, the chef who had been there at the beginning I, is somebody who I like an awful lot. Yeah. So I felt very bad about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it happens. It happens. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I took over after that that review and um 
you know, I, I nobody really nobody knew who I was. I didn't even know who I was. Like I yeah. didn't even have a really a voice in food at that time, and it was my first big job. You know, it was like I was leaving, uh, leaving a place that I had been for a year, and um, you know, it was really taking the reins of my own kitchen, and uh, you know, it was exciting for me. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. I definitely wasn't ready for it, and I feel like a lot of times I was just kind of like throwing things to the wall to see what stuck. Um, but it took me a good year to like get out of that headspace where it was like, okay, I need to take ownership of this kitchen. And, you know, about a year and a half later, they wanted to sell the restaurant. Um, and it was something that I didn't want at all. Um, and I was like, you know, I was already getting ready to like write business plans and kind of move on and figure out what I was going to do next. Um, and I, I did want to own something. I just didn't know mm -hmm. if I wanted to own that place right. because I felt like the history had been so tumultuous. And I was yes. like, well, you know, do I need a fresh start? What am I going to do? I mean, that's a hell of a legacy to take yeah. on somewhere that had not really been known for the food so much. Yeah. I went back and read old reviews from like decades past and it was saying, you know, it's a place where before before the Coke Den days, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if your parents are paying for yeah. it, it yeah. kind of thing, but it, it had been known for the, the atmosphere and stuff, but I had never really seen note taken of the food. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, to go through that and to, to think about purchasing a piece of, you know, very much New York history, maybe not the best history okay. at all times, um, but purchasing a piece of New York history like that and, and becoming a part of its next chapter um, for me was something that was tremendously scary because um, it's, a, it's a huge legacy to carry on. And, um, you know, I, I really didn't want it. And I, I called Pat Lafreda, who, um, you know, for those of you that don't know who he is, he's like America's butcher. <laughs> um, but I called Pat Lafreda and I said, you know, what do I do? Like, what do I do? And he, without even skipping a beat, he said, buy the business. Buy the business. What else? And I was like, lamenting about it. And I was going, you're crazy. It's got terrible history. What am I going to do? Like, how okay. can I bring it back from that? Talking yourself out of it? Yeah, I was talking myself out of it. Exactly. And he was like, you, like, this is a fresh start. It's a fresh start for the whole business. And he's like, you know, it's not very often that you get a piece uh, an opportunity to buy a piece of landmark history. So you need to do it. And if you can bring that restaurant back from the dead, it's going to make your career. And um, I literally started negotiating the next day, closed on it a year later. That's And let's talk about your path to get to this place. You grew up in restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. I um, So my aunt is Ruby Chow um, and she owned uh, a restaurant in Seattle, which was Chinese food, but it wasn't Chinese food where you and I think about Chinese food. Like it's this cheap whatever. It was like, it was like, you know, a Rick's Bar American in Casablanca. Like, you know, that's what it was. And very glam. Right? Very glam. Yeah. And she, you know, everyone was dressed up all the time. And it would be people like Warren Magnuson and Sammy Davis Jr. and Sidney Portier. And a very notable dishwasher. Bruce Lee was her dishwasher. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce Lee was her dishwasher. Yeah. So I, you know, I, that was before I was, before I was born, but we had, my family had a, a multitude of other restaurants and frozen food business in Seattle. And so I grew up running around those places, um, you know, and I, I didn't want to cook and it's something that my parents didn't want for me to do because at the time they, um, you know, they all got into the food and beverage industry because of the Chinese Exclusionary Act mm -hmm. Could because you? they were coming out of the war. Yeah. yeah talk so, about that a little bit. So when they were coming out of the World War II, um, there was an act called the Chinese Exclusionary Act. And basically, if you were Chinese in America, you could get into one of two industries. It could be laundry or food. And that was it. Um, so Warren Magnuson, who became a very good friend of my aunt, was actually responsible for helping to repeal that. Um, but, but that's what it was. I mean, that's what it was at the time. And, um, so my family got into the restaurant industry because they had no other choice, not necessarily because they had a passion for it, mm -hmm. but because they had no other choice. And I feel like, you know, over the years, I think it became a passion for them. Um, 
And so, you know, and still in Seattle, my family has restaurants and, um, you know, I, I own the Beatrice with my cousin. So it's, uh, it's definitely, you know, soup to nuts, family run business. Uh, you and there, there's sort of a leitmotif here because uh, you were, tr- you, you were saying you were trying to run away from buying the bee. You yeah. weren't in restaurants for a while. You took a totally different path yeah, for a while. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, so for over 10 years, I was living in L.A. and I was in commercial real estate. Um, and it was one of these things that, you know, I was good at it. I made a lot of money. I got to travel. Um, and I had a really fantastic time doing it, but I wasn't very passionate about it. And I grew up where it was like, you know, Sunday supper every week with the family um and food was such a huge part of my upbringing that i when you know when i decided i didn't want to be in the corporate world i said okay you know i'm gonna quit my job i'm gonna take whatever i've saved i'm gonna go travel all over and i did and um it wasn't until i was traveling that i really figured out what i wanted to do and uh, you know i ran out of money essentially um, cause I'd spent it all traveling around Europe, uh, came back to the States and took whatever I had left, uh, moved to New York, invested in culinary school and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't know that cooking was going to be your dream. Was it at all daunting to all of a sudden say, I'm going into the kitchen, not just being front of house, not owning a place because you have a business background and stuff, but deciding that you wanted to approach it from a food angle. Can you talk about that decision? Yeah. Um, You know, I think I really took to it just, you know, it was so easy for me because it was, you know, growing up around that industry, it was just like, okay, I'm just going to get in the kitchen. Um, I think the toughest part was uh, making the financial leap and, you know, going from making, um, you know, six figures a year to, you know, at the time, I think minimum wage was like seven fifty an hour. And, you know, I went to to making minimum wage and I was shucking oysters and sweeping the floor and peeling onions. Um, And, you know, to go from, from this lifestyle of like, you know, business class all the time right. when I traveled <laughs> to like, you know, not being able to afford the subway in New York was mm-hmm. like, you know, and I, I didn't, yeah, Definitely exactly. <laughs> Everybody should be there their first year in New York. You know, yeah. I like, I didn't eat unless oh, yeah. I was at family meal at the restaurant I was working at. I, is, I, I didn't eat. This is something that keeps coming up in my conversations with chefs. I was talking about it with the Voltagios and mm-hmm. saying that tremendous disconnect that you are the people who are, are feeding, um, you yeah. know, your, your clientele and, you know, often on the high end mm-hmm. and might not necessarily be able to afford to eat yourselves. I don't think people realize how little cooks make. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think it's different now. I mean, with the rise in minimum wage and, you know, all the things. And we, um, you know, I think that, you know, I, I know that um, as a restaurant, we make sure that we pay everybody, yeah. um, you know, like a, a living wage yeah. because it's important. It's and that's crucial. why we have such a, a low attrition rate. But, um, you know, it's it was it was hard. Yeah, it was really hard. I always say that people I've this will be 20. 20, was it 23 years for me mm-hmm. here in New York this year? I always say, like, if you can make it through that first couple of yeah. years. Um, but I've definitely had that thing where I had to choose between, like, okay, ramen or taking the yeah. subway. You take yeah. a lot of yeah. walks home. I forget there was some chef I was talking with and, and talking about like those, those nights walking over the bridge back to Brooklyn yeah. because you, you can't necessarily afford the train. Yeah. What kept you going during that time? Um, you know, I was just so happy to be in New York and, um, (laughs) yeah, I was so happy to be in New York and I was so excited to be doing what I loved and learning something new Mm -hmm. that it was all worth it. Like everything was all worth it. Did this surprise people in your life that you were, you know, business yeah. class and, yeah. and all this stuff and all of a sudden like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, was, did you yeah. have pushback from people in your life? Um, no, I think for the most part, everybody was really supportive. I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, my mom questioned it. I think she was very much, you know, because she's, um, you know, she's from Taipei and, you know, bounced back and forth between Taiwan and the UK. And uh, it's a very traditional family on her side of the family. So mm-hmm. I think she was really like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're crazy. Um, but, you know, she's come around and she's, you know, everybody's so supportive now. 
That's such a great thing. I mean, as yeah. a person who sort of switched careers in her early 30s, yeah. I, which I, I, I did this, you know, and it wasn't maybe as violent <laughs> a shift in some ways, but, you know, being an art director and then, uh, you know, going more into writing it, I, I kept having these moments at the beginning, especially at the beginning, still have mm -hmm. them now because I feel like I got a late start and yeah. I feel like there are things that everybody else knows yeah. and I feel almost, and now I'm like sort of switching to print and I'm like, <laughs> I, there are all these things that I don't know. And I had this perpetual feeling for a long time about like sort of almost be embarrassed that I was feeling behind. But at the same time, I realized that everything leading up to that point yeah. informed what I did. So you came to this from yeah. with, real estate in mind and yeah. other things. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because, um, you know, a lot of people ask, I mean, what, I've been in New York for almost 10 years now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody always asks me, they're like, well, you know, this is what your family did and you spent all this time in real estate and in business. And so, you know, if you could go back, mm -hmm. um, would you have cut all of that out and just been cooking the whole time? And the answer is no. Like the yeah. answer is no, like all of that stuff, because at the end of the day, it's, you know, creativity is fantastic. And, uh, you know, that is obviously why I cook, because I love the creative aspect of it. But that's completely different than running a restaurant, running yeah. and owning a restaurant, and operating it. That's a business. And so for me to have that background and be able to say, OK, my labor costs are here. You know, my rent is here. Um, understanding a P&L, you know, all of that. That's those are skills that I wouldn't have had had I not had my previous career. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's been tremendously helpful. Well, you also made a really smart uh, decision to you. Um, so you are a food and wine best new chef. <laughs> and we uh, rely very heavily on the knowledge and the mentorship of mm. the people in the program. And, and last year, you uh, hosted an event at your restaurant mm -hmm. where you were talking about business decisions and mm -hmm. making them. And you were saying, you know, and people were talking through bad contracts that they'd gotten, yeah. mistakes that they had made. But you decided to go into business with cousin yes mm -hmm. so can you talk about how you sorted that out and decided that was the route that you were going to take mm -hmm. um well that's something that I think has been really ingrained in my family um because you know my father was one of 10 kids and they grew up during the depression yeah. and um his older sister Ruby um and a couple of my aunts were living in New York and when his parents passed away they came back and they kept the family together. So for us, you know, we grew up literally being told, like, you start a business, you start it with the family. You make money, you make it for the family. And every move that my family's made is solely for their survival and for the betterment of the family as a whole, not just individually. So for us to go into business together, my cousin Melissa and I, that's a no-brainer. It's, you know, we don't want any outside money. We don't want any outside opinions. We just want to do it with us and have it be for us us and for the family. Um, and just like, you know, my brothers run our website, they design my menus. Oh, wow. um, you know, it is, it truly is for the betterment of, of all of us. I feel like I've met a cousin, like there was, there was somebody working there and like, oh, that's cousin or nephew, or it was something yeah. like that. Yeah. I think that has happened on multiple occasions. Yeah. Well, Jordan, who it was one of my cooks, mm -hmm. um, he, you know, he's my second cousin and I grew up running around his father's restaurant in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, and he moved to New York and started working for Melissa and I. So, you know, it very much does perpetuate like all the fundamentals that, you know, my, my father and my uncles and aunts, you know, taught us, which is you start a business, you bring the family into it, you know, you give jobs to the family and help everybody grow. So there's family means a whole lot of different things in there. Mm -hmm. I have seen a whole lot of faces that have been there the whole uh, time since mm -hmm. before you owned the place. There is not a whole lot of, of turnover mm -hmm. of that. So you came into this with this intense, you, you, you picked up a cooking education, you mm -hmm. worked in those things. Front of house, how did you establish your footprint there? Mm -hmm. I feel like there are some people who I had seen there, you know, from the previous days. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how you developed that that vision for the totality of the place? Because Beatrice isn't just what's on on the plate, which is you know a tremendous thing, but it's also a particular sort of aesthetic and feeling that happens when you're there. Mm -hmm. How did you unify that vision? How did you bring kind of front of house into the fold? Yeah, you know, um, one of my favorite things that Marco Pierre White says is that 
in order to have a really great restaurant, you have to have ambiance, followed by service, followed by food. Those are the three things, and it has to be in that order. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us, you know, we have had low attrition in the front and the back of the house, mm-hmm. um, but a lot of it has been because I have really great people. And, you know, you have to, like I always say this, like you got to kiss a lot of frogs to get the prints, <laughs> right? And I've had some not so great people, mm-hmm. um, but we typically recognize who those people are and, you know, we move in a different direction as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. And we hold on to the people that we value and we hold on to the people that really have gotten behind the vision of what the Beatrice is because you're right, it's not just about the food. It's about, you know, the ambiance. It's about the service. It's about that witty repartee that you have with my bartenders yeah. and the servers whenever you come in to eat. Um, but it's unifying the front of house and saying, look, this is the vision, you guys, and this is the direction that we're going to move in. Um, and that has been a huge learning curve for me um, because, you know, I am like a notorious, like I'm, you know, I'm not the easiest person to work for. Um, I very much demand, um, you know, I demand a lot. I demand a lot of perfection and, um, you know, it's, I want the best. And I don't ever feel like we should apologize for that, you know. Um, I think that the industry is very different now than it is than it was 10 years ago when two I years started ago, yeah 2 years ago even and I feel like when I got into this industry it was like you had a level of professional that they were like they were lifers mm-hmm. and it's like this is our profession and we're very proud of what we do and you know and the industry has changed so much um where it is, I think, a younger generation coming in. Um, and I, it could not just be with our industry. I think it's a generational thing, mm-hmm. right? Where it's like fast, you know, oh gosh, fast rewards. We're not the young kids anymore. No, we're not the young kids anymore. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I know, it's it crazy. It strikes me on the regular. Yeah. Um, so I think that it is, you know, it is a matter of cultivating the and kind of reprogramming Um, The people that we do have come in to say, okay, look, we're all going to start from the bottom. You start from the bottom no matter what, and you work your way up. And that's just how it works in our restaurant. Um, We're also very selective of who we hire. Um, You know, I don't ever hire anybody on the first date, ever. (laughs) Um, You know, it's like an interview, and Mm -hmm. then it's like five trails, and, you know, we got to think about it, and we send you off to go think about it, because we only want people at our restaurant that are truly the right fit and are really going to live eat and breathe um, the ethos of that restaurant. Let's talk about then once they're there. Mm -hmm. um, I know mentorship is something that's incredibly important to you. And I got a chance once to sit through lineup, which was, (laughs) you know, I love watching lineups at restaurants because, you know, so often it's, you know, it's just sort of bullet point. Like, here's what we're serving tonight. Here are the, you know, VIP tables. Here's, you know, you know, whatever it happens to be. But there was this cool thing that you do with a quote. Let's talk about this. (laughs) So um, we have essentially two meetings every day. Um, One is lineup with the whole front of the house. And the one uh, at the end of the night is with the entire kitchen. Um, but line up in the front of the house is, you know, what are we serving today? What are the oysters on the menu? VIPs, etc. But we end that meeting with a quote. So we we do pick a quote every single day, mm-hmm. um, and it's a different quote. And somebody will read it every single day, and it's what it means to that person and how it pertains to what we do. Um, And I think it's a really interesting way to bring it back to service and hospitality and uh, the betterment of ourselves individually and also as a team. Um, So that's what we do front of the house. It was really fun. I'm trying to remember what the quote was um, when I was in there. And it's funny because the the person brings it with with, uh, sort of pride and then people sort of look around like, am I going to be called on? Yeah. (laughs) It's yeah, a hundred percent. Um, and then we do it again in the, the end of the night. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've never been one of these chefs that, uh, you know, s- comes in, stays through the push and then leaves. That's not who I am. You know, I am there all the time. I'm there before my cooks get there. I'm there after they leave. Um, and we end our shift in the kitchen with an end of night meeting. And one of the cooks every single day, a different one every day, is responsible for bringing a quote. They talk about what it means to them, how it pertains to service. We also talk about what went wrong, what went right, 
during service, what we want to improve upon the next day, both individually and as a team. Um, you know, it's, it's really interesting because I, um, I, you know, when I was coming up, it was like you would finish service, you would clean down the kitchen, then you would go to the bar down the street, have a couple of beers and like blow off some steam. And, you know, I actually, I, I don't really drink that much, you know, I have champagne with you <laughs> and, you know, that's about <laughs> it. But, um, you know, because I actually believe that like when I drink it, it messes with my palate. So when yeah. I'm working, I actually don't, I don't drink at all and it's just water. Um, and lots of coffee. Um, but, <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> coffee habits. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's really interesting because when we started doing these meetings with my kitchen and it like allowed for this open dialogue of this is what I this is what I did today that I made this decision and maybe it wasn't the right decision. And, you know, I got behind um, and then I let my team down and then, you know, all these other things. And tomorrow I'm going to work on this. Mm -hmm. Um and when every single person does that, it almost, and I didn't notice this till maybe like eight months into us doing this, it almost was like allowing them to kind of blow off that steam yeah. in the meeting and really be, okay, like this is what happened. I'm good. I now know what I'm going to work on tomorrow. And they just go home now. That, they that, just go home. Because that great. racing mind after yeah. service is Where the you just, downfall yeah. of so many. So many people. Yeah. So many people. So yeah, so they, they kind of blow off the steam there in the meeting and mm -hmm. then they just go home. And I'm elated because my food's not like super salty the next day because they've been out drinking. <laughs> right. So, you know what I mean? Um, but I, it's it's really good and it's it, it allows for this healthy, nurturing environment for them. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you know, I feel like one of my goals for the Beatrice is for it to become this New York standard. Yeah. Right. It's had such a long history throughout New York. And for me, it is, you know, such an honor to be part of the restaurant's next chapter. Like not for it to be one of mine, but mm -hmm. for me to be part of its you're next the, chapter. The it was there way longer before yeah. I is gonna be there after I'm gone, you know, and for me it's just it's such an honor to be a part of this chapter in in its history. And um, you know, with what we're doing and and you know, the people that we have here, it's like, this is the next generation of restaurant professionals. And, you know, I don't, uh, for lack of a better term, I don't want to send a bunch of jerks out into the world. You know, yes. I want to send some really great people out into the world. Sure, yeah. And, you know, what I think that's about is, you know, calling people out on their mistakes, um, letting them know how they can do it better, um, not taking any bullshit, and really kind of bringing it back to that, like, old school way that I was brought up but in a more constructive way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's it, let, So let's talk about, you see, you know, anything, something on the wrong course about how you address that. I remember seeing you after a festival where you were having a hard time getting paid and you chased that check I in did. a way that <laughs> I was just, I, I was so impressed because you, you know, you do it with grace. So you, you see something wrong. How do you address when something has gone not correctly? Well, I, with our staff or with... with yeah, with, yeah. Like, so with staff and then, but also finding that sort of way to assert yourself in a, you know, professional yeah. way, but like to a vendor, to a, a customer, to a, you yeah, know, whatever absolutely. it happens to be. Like yeah, that. You know, it's really interesting. I think, you know, with, um, I mean, with our end of night meetings and mm -hmm. how we deal with staff, it's, I think it's very, very, you know, constructive and mm -hmm. self-explanatory. And um, I found that w by us having these mm -hmm. meetings yeah. and, um, you know, they've, they've all become better cooks, but yeah. they're actually really great people as well. Yeah. Um, because that's really really what it is mm -hmm. right it's it's not just about who we become mm -hmm. you know I've had some bad ones yeah. I've had some I've definitely had some bad ones I mean, it's the universe you know that you, you send some bad ones out into the yeah. world sometime that's a you know that's yeah. okay um you didn't break them to begin with. I didn't break them exactly <laughs> um but the ones that we do have now that have you know been here and and really dug into the culture at the mm -hmm. restaurant um you know I am so excited for their future because mm -hmm. my goal for them is for them to become better than me yeah you know that's like the family tree right oh god you I love a family tree yeah right it's you want so them to go and do and other things 
exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, about the money situation, I, uh, you know, to answer your question, I... People like to take advantage of chefs in these they situations do. for festivals, for, mm-hmm. um, you know, for any of these these big mm-hmm. sort of dine around kind of things. Mm-hmm. Like people try to scrub over chefs and I imagine... 100%. It, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, we've, we've all dealt with it. I, I can't imagine a chef out there who hasn't dealt with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I am, uh, I am the girl, you know, that I started out with no money. You yeah. know, when I moved to New York, I had $250 in my bank account. I had two suitcases and I didn't have a place to live. Like that's literally where I started out here because I'd spent all the money that I saved. Yeah. So, you know, I think over the course of almost 10 years of living here, it's like I've been broke so many times yeah. that I don't really worry about money. I'm always going to make more. However, with that being said, I don't get taken advantage of because yeah. I'm always like, you know, where's the check? Right. And did it clear the account? Yeah. That's all I really care about. You know what I mean? It's, it's what it is. It's a business. Yeah. And, and I think people do, yeah. especially, uh, you know, again, hate to get gendered, but people see female chefs, female owners, and, and they mm-hmm. think they can pull something. Yeah. Maybe. And I've, I've just seen that happen to so many people. So yeah. you have to sometimes extra rise up yeah. and do it, but do it with 100%. a damn smile on your face. Yeah. I think it's about, I think it's about handling those situations with grace, mm-hmm. um, but also with a very firm hand. Yeah. You know, also with a very firm hand. Um, you know, and I mean, it's no secret. Like I, you know, I, I will always make sure that, that all of our affairs are in order and that's just what we do. Yeah. And yeah. so let's talk about how you take care of your people mm. because I, I, I loved <clears throat> that I, I went in one night, it was a, it was a Cinco de Mayo Yeah. and uh, I knew there was going to be a different a meal that night. You turned over the menu to your cooks to say you, you, it, there was no like regular Beatrice yeah. menus in the, uh, menu food in there that night. It was mm-hmm. specifically for the, the people from your kitchen. And then also I threw you a curveball by accidentally bringing in a vegan. Yeah. You did. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's talk about like the giving over um, authorship to mm-hmm. some of the people in your kitchen. I've seen, you know, you, you shout out your cooks in really tremendous ways mm-hmm. and stuff. So how do they, you know, just giving them permission to, uh, you know, show who they are through the drinks, through the menu, through any of those kind of things. Yeah. You know, um, I think it's really important for that. I think it's important for their growth and their creativity. Um, family meal is a huge, huge thing in our restaurant. Yeah. It's a huge thing. Um, you know, I, when I was coming up, I used to like grab family meal and I would eat it in like two seconds out of a yeah. quart container, you know, and I would continue prepping. I can always spot a chef eating somewhere in front of a house person. Cause yeah, yeah there's that exactly. Super fast You're thing. just like that super fast thing and you like inhale the food and, um, and that's it. But for us, it's like family meal is, it's an entire production. Um, pasta is not allowed. Like, that's a thing. Wow. Like, you can't make pasta. Um, you can order whatever you want, you know, within reason. Um, but we all sit at the exact same table every day between 4 and 4.30. Front of house, back of house, um, dishwashers, everyone. Um, and it's really important for me for us to have that time to all sit together um, and just kind of disconnect from the restaurant and just really be with each other because – You know, we talk about like my family, like that I'm born into when this is the family that I've chosen. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, because it's such a serious thing, it's like nobody's allowed to make pasta. Everybody's got to make something really, really great. Um, And that's a time where they're very much encouraged to, you know, flex their creativity and, you know, make something amazing um, because they've got to cook my food day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, there are like special occasions where it's like, um, you know, we do like we do do like the Cinco de Mayo or that like, things like that. Gorgeous meal. It's, it's really fun, really, right? It was it was it was wonderful yeah. because I knew that these were these chefs who cooked to your standards and, yeah. and bringing in their voice to it. And you did it in such a, a wonderfully celebratory yeah. kind of way. I remember I brought Daniel Patterson in that night yeah. too. He was not the vegan. <laughs> and the vegan was delightful, but like, you know, a plate came out and it was fully vegan and it was so beautiful. Yeah. And, the, and the guy who got it looked like he won the lottery. It's amazing. But yeah. It I was, love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, my sous chef Lucero um, really spearheaded that. Yeah. Uh, and she spearheads Cinco de Mayo and she's amazing. She's been with mm-hmm. me for almost five years. Yeah. 
Um, and that is her mother's and her grandmother's food that you guys had. Yeah. And really taking that, and there's so much love and so much soul um, in that food. And for her, it's that like really amazing time where she gets to share all this food from her family, but how she's reinterpreted it. Yeah. Yeah. It was and like that was an exciting thing to do. So let's let's also talk about like the prof- so the professional mentorship is so mm-hmm. important for you. Who taught you? Um, you know, it's really interesting. I uh, I feel like I haven't really had a mentor that's mm-hmm. been in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Um, Pat Lafreda has been the person that's really guided me and shown me, you know, how to lead. And um, you know, for all the success that he's had, he is literally at Lafreda Meats every single night on the floor cutting meat with his his team. Um, and every time that I think that I am, you know, tired because I haven't slept in like two or three days <laughs> yeah. or, you know, I've had so many things in a row or I'm dealing with like, you know, whatever I'm dealing with, I will literally call him and I'll be like, you know, what are you doing right now? And he's like, you know, it's, it's four in the morning and he's like still at the office. He's still cutting meat. He's still, you know, answering emails. And it like, I'm always like, oh, I can do more. I can handle more, you know, um, But he was the one who really helped me with, like, how to not only survive in this industry, but also Mm -hmm. thrive. Yeah. I mean, and y'all have had crazy... I I think of you two as collaborators. Yeah. And I want to talk about your wet-aged meat, your whiskey-aged meat. I really haven't seen that done elsewhere. And... Could you describe this for people who have not experienced this (laughs) this thing? Um, So I'm really excited about it. And it's something, you know, every fall season we we release a new dry aging technique. And it instantly becomes the most polarizing dish in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, half the people love it. Half the people are upset because they think it's too expensive. And I don't really care either way. (laughs) You know what I mean? All I really care about is that we're pushing the industry forward. So um, whiskey aging is something that I started to do it's actually technically not wet aging it's Mm. a dry aging process okay yeah yeah and um but we age the beef in whiskey and um i've never actually released my technique i'm actually going to be doing that um in my cookbook that's coming out this fall (laughs) yeah so i'm really excited about that but um you know i've dropped like hints here and there um Mm. on how i do it and i released it first in 2016 uh when my restaurant opened um And it was like one of these magnets for the press. (laughs) It was just like, she's charging $1,000 a steak. Is she insane? Um, And then there were other people like, you know, my food and wine family, like, you know, like Pete Wells that like really got it. Yeah, it's alive. It tastes alive. How many days is on this meat? It's uh, it's aged for 160 days yeah. in whiskey, and um, the whiskey that we use is uh, Bren, which um, is made by this amazing woman, Allison Park, um, and she's a former New York City ballerina. What? She's a career changer. <laughs> you should have her on the podcast. I clearly yeah, need she's, this. she's incredible. Um, but it's it's a single malt whiskey that's distilled in cognac, France, um, and it's left to age in cognac barrels. So when we age the beef in it, you get the flavors of not only the whiskey, but also the cognac barrels. And there's all of this beautiful vanilla and oak and very nuanced flavors. Um, you know, so it's it's really exciting, and and that's almost three years ago now that that I released that, and um, you know, we were the first ones to do it in the United States, and now you know, like, uh, you know, almost three years later, it's like I think Dixon's Farm Stand is like whiskey aging, wow. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and a couple other restaurants around the country are starting to do it. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's exciting for me because it means that what we have done has been a pioneering technique in our industry and and that's really what I care about is that what are we doing to push the industry forward so the, yeah there are definitely dishes on your menu that I have mm-hmm. not seen in other places that I associate so heavily with you now I'm thinking a lot about the bone marrow creme brulee yeah. that you <laughs> do and she referred earlier to my tattoo I upped my osobuco bone <laughs> I have a marrow scoop because I, lo- I love, I love it I love and actually funny thing previous podcast guest um uh-huh. brian voltaggio he and i actually got tattoos together yeah. <laughs> and i got that tattoo th- yeah. that day but it's one of those things where yeah. uh, 
Yeah, I, I am so tied to it. So could you describe this dish and, and the decision? Uh, it's it's plated in a very curious way. Yeah. Um, so we do a bone marrow bourbon creme brulee. And, uh, you know, when I came up with it, it was before I owned the restaurant. And um, I was going to cook at my very first James Beard dinner. So I had gotten all of this, like, illegal breeds of beef, uh, packed in suitcases, flown in <laughs> to the States, um, you know, and it was like, I got, like, amazing breeds of of steers. So we had Blonde Dacoutine, we had Rubia, I had Galician beef from Spain. Um, and nobody actually cared about the beef um, and how special it was because everybody was just really excited for this bone marrow creme brulee. Um, so it, you know, it's, uh, we basically take bone marrow, we roast the bones, scoop the marrow out, puree it with a bourbon custard and it bakes, you know, like just like a creme brulee, but it gets filled back into the bone itself. <laughs> um, you know, so it's, you know, it's exciting. It's another one of those dishes that, uh, has very much become a Beatrice in classic. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's exciting for me. Yeah. The- like the the plating that you have for some of these things too. Let's talk about when that duck arrives at yeah. the table. So this was, um, if you're familiar with the uh, the December cover yes. <laughs> dish of food and wine, it is a duck on fire, and that is Angie's duck. <laughs> and you talk about how you developed that recipe and that presentation with yeah. fire in a contained space. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it wouldn't be the Beatrice Inn if we weren't lighting something on fire <laughs> or if it wasn't smoked or something. Um, but uh, yeah, so the duck is actually a play on my father's duck. And um, Christmas and Thanksgiving, he used to do this smoked duck and he would cold smoke it for like 18 hours. And it is amazing. It's like one of the most amazing dishes ever and we would fight over it all the time. Mm. And when I bought the restaurant, I wanted to do something that really paid homage to him and the way we grew up. And, um, you know, when I, when I was a kid, we used to go to Chinatown all the time and, um, there would be like the Peking ducks hanging in the windows. And I was so obsessed with them because they were like lacquered and shiny and beautiful. And, um, you know, I, I wanted it to look like those ducks but tastes like my father's duck that he made yeah. on Christmas. So we kind of married the two. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's a long process, that one. Yeah, talk to me about the yeah. smoking. Yeah. So it's, uh, so we actually dry the ducks and then we cure them and then we smoke them um, with cherry wood and then we slow roast it. So it's it's a lot. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. <laughs> I have taken the carcass of uh, those ducks home and uh, yeah. made soup with them for days. They after. make everything better. It's it's really. <laughs> I I I'm, I feel like we're almost being cruel to the people listening to this because they like yeah. they deserve to have this in their Yeah, I, I always get disappointed when people don't want to take the carcasses home because <gasps> I'm like, it? oh my god. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> the bones that come home, like it's it's beautiful yeah. things. So you you've talked before about how you 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 love your fruits, you love your meats, you yeah. love various things, not so much into your veggies. But no. there are some kind of veggies that you have uh, em- embraced. I've had your carnival squash. Yes, very good. That you I are like that one. a reluctant uh, vegetable person. Can you yeah, talk about that? Yeah, you know, it's well, so my mom, uh, my mom grew up in Taipei, so or and and the UK. So whenever she would make Brussels sprouts, she would boil them like until oh, they were mush and like they were gray. That, yeah. And so I'm just like, yeah. So I, I have a couple weird things. It's like, you know, I, I do like vegetables when they have a very high sugar content, mm-hmm. like, you know, squash. Um, I like them when they're peppery and cold, like, you know, uh, radishes like french breakfast radishes and mm-hmm. romaine oh, God, love this. I grow um, those. yeah you know like i love those mm-hmm. um and then the other thing too is uh i actually don't eat fish that's cooked mm-hmm. um for me i have to eat fish that's either raw or that's fried but i won't eat cooked fish mm-hmm. um and that's like another weird weird we thing that i have that. yeah well, I think if anybody was looking at your Instagram, they would assume that you <laughs> subsist entirely on uh, meat eaten off the bone in your bed. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about social media because you have such a distinct presence on on social media. Um, let's talk about you know that and and sort of crafting that and getting your a, a lot of Beatrice's um, image is tied up in the way that it's portrayed there. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you learned how to do that. 
Um, well, you know, it's it's really just who I am and my other interests. You know, mm-hmm. that like that social media thing is. Um, you know that's that's truly that's truly how I dress, and she this is truly does legit <laughs> eat meat off the bone. I do, bed. I do, I actually do. Uh, that's my breakfast. It's the breakfast of champions, cat. <laughs> <laughs> mm. No, I um I love fashion. Mm-hmm. So you know I am always like constant. I mean, this was New York Fashion Week. I'm like constantly mm-hmm. following the shows and the designers and. Um, you know, and so many of them are regulars at my restaurant as well. And I just, I love it, you know, and I, I think that if I weren't cooking, I would probably want to do something in mm-hmm. fashion, you know. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it very much is this, like, the Beatrice has very much become this, like, you know, place for, like, artists and, you know, uh, the fashion crew and, um, you know, and just people who just really love food. Like that's yeah. it, you know, um, and it's it's very interesting, you know, because we talk about you know you've got people that come in and they're like, well, you know, there's only meat on this menu. What am I supposed to eat? And I was like, there's a million other restaurants because because <laughs> my restaurant isn't for everybody. Yeah, it's not. I, you know, that's a really important lesson I think for especially chefs to learn. They don't have to be everything for no, everyone, and can't. you are you have so defined who you are and what you are. In the in the restaurant, that can be a scary decision to realize. Like, okay, I'm go- not going to have this easy dish on my menu. Yeah. And how do you was that a, was that a scary thing to do, or was that an empowering thing to do? I felt like it was tremendously empowering, and you know, to get there it was scary. Yeah. You know, to get there. <laughs> uh, but once I actually got there, and I realized it, I was like, okay. So you know, when I when I bought the restaurant, I had we closed for the whole month of August. Yeah. I remember. And. Um, you know, it was that month I was in the restaurant every single day cooking and recipe testing and, you know, just trying to get my menu down. And I had so many people saying, well, you need a fish dish and you need a pasta dish and you need more salads and da da da. And I was, they were like, what are the ladies going to eat? And I was like, <laughs> what? You got to, what? Yeah. People actually oh, said, God. well, you know, if you don't have like a six ounce portion of fish, what are the ladies going to eat? And I was like, all the ladies I know eat steak. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what ladies you know, but they can go somewhere else. Um, um, and, and, you know, so it was, it was a lot and mm-hmm. I felt myself becoming very lost and, and like, you know, I was already trying to find my creative voice and mm-hmm. what I wanted to say with this restaurant and what I wanted to say with my menu and my food. And I felt myself really losing sight of that because I just had all of these voices saying, you should, you should, you should, you should. And, um, it took me taking that menu, what I had written so far, Mm -hmm. tearing the whole thing up, barricading myself in that restaurant and not speaking to anybody for a month. Yeah. I didn't speak to anyone for a month. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to cook. I'm just going to cook. And right out of the gate, it was, okay, you know, if I have to have a chicken for somebody, you know, who might not know who I am, because nobody knew who I was at that point, Mm -hmm. right? Nobody trusted who I was, right? Because I didn't have a track record. So fine, I'll give you a chicken, but I'm going to get a French brass hen (laughs) that's very gamey, and I'm going to serve it with its head and feet on, and, you know, I'm going to call it poulet petite fille, and it's going to be this rock and roll version of, you know, poulet grammaire, and that's what we're going to do. So it was cooking 90% of the menu when I first started. 90% of the menu was everything that I wanted it to be, and 10% of the menu was um, done in a recognizable, approachable way, Mm -hmm. but was still my style. Yeah. And the day after my Times review came Mm -hmm. out, which I was on the phone, I thought I was going to have a heart attack (laughs) that week. Um, But, you know, the day after my review Mm -hmm. came out, I took every single dish that was on that 10% of the menu off. Yeah. And I was like, we're done. I can now do 100% of what I want. Yeah. And I've been doing it ever since. There is a pie with a bone sticking up out of it. <laughs> or, or wait, is there a foot sticking up out of something? Or was No, but there's definitely birds with their heads <laughs> and feet on. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was talking uh, recently with the casting director uh, from Chops uh-huh. uh, about you. And 
that uh, so for people who don't know angie won chopped grill masters paid for all my legal fees to buy the restaurant <laughs> <laughs> which is you know an incredible thing but um that was some of the first media that you yeah. were were doing and that is a, a thing where you know i spend a lot of time with a lot of pit masters and mm-hmm. and really great people and but the public presentation of kind of what a pit master is is very different than the thing you do was that yeah. a, a scary thing for you at all like how how do you define yourself in the middle of this you know, it was really interesting because I didn't want to do that show at all. <laughs> she, yeah, she was saying, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to do that show at all. And um, you know, I, I was actually, uh, I was forced into doing it by mm-hmm. Pat Lafreda. Like he was, like, you have <laughs> he to do like it. You're he's crazy. The angel on your shoulder, is, maybe yeah. the devil on your shoulder. He sometimes is. in some good ways. Uh, yeah, no, he, he forced me to do it. I was so angry, <laughs> and um, I'll never forget the morning that I showed up. It was like in Queens. It was filmed in Queens. I'd gotten off of a red eye flight. Uh, from Paris and went straight to Queens and uh, they take your phones away, Mm -hmm. you know? And so it was probably about five in the morning and I was sitting in a green room and I texted Pat and I said, if I get kicked off after appetizers, I'm never speaking to you again. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But it worked out fine. So uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was good. It was, it was interesting. And it was, um, I think that America's idea of live fire cooking Mm -hmm. immediately goes to barbecue and that's not what it is and I think that you know and I hope that my hope my great hope is that um eventually people will be more educated in the fact that there's a ton of different ways to cook over live fire and it's not just about barbecuing and I think that's like America's go-to but you know we do so such interesting things at the restaurant and like you know I've cooked all over Europe so um, you know to be able to take some of these techniques back here um, and incorporate them on our menu is really exciting for me and we do a lot of live fire cooking Um, I've I've been in that kitchen (laughs) where we had uh, it was running so hot in there we had to the the cameras were shutting off. Yeah. Okay. Lights have melted. Like it's uh, yeah. let's talk about I, I think so you make this massive food. If people could see how little your kitchen is yeah. in there. Yeah. So yeah, let's let's paint people a word picture of what your kitchen <laughs> looks like. Um well I uh, the restaurant is uh 2,600 square feet. Um, I have 133 seats, including the bar. Um, and the kitchen occupies less than 200 square feet. Mm-hmm. So it's insane. It's, you know, <laughs> I was at Per Se the other night. Um, and on Sunday, I took uh, one of my, one, I call them my kids, but, you know, I took <laughs> one of my kids. Um, she's actually my chef de salon. She does all the table side stuff at, uh, at the restaurant. And I took her to Per Se. She had her first experience at Per Se. And um, we did the kitchen tour afterwards. And the kitchen there is huge. Oh, yeah. Yes. It's huge. And she texted me afterwards and she was like, I didn't realize how badass we are. Oh. She goes, our kitchen is 200. She goes, our kitchen is the size of their chocolate room. And I was like, yeah, I know. I was like, and I know. there's stairs too. too. Yeah, like, yeah, it's, yeah. it's intense. And so soon people are going to know a lot more about what you do and how you do it because you have this book. Yeah, I'm is. really excited. So let's talk about the process. And uh, the masochism, <laughs> yeah. straight up masochism. You've done it. I have written a book. It is one of the most masochistic things a yeah. person can possibly do. But yeah. so you're doing this on top of owning and running a restaurant, mm. and you travel and cook as well. I do. I travel and cook. I, um, you know, it is. It's a lot, yeah. and um, yeah. you know, to be honest, and you know, the guy I, I wrote about this in my book actually. How uh, there have been so many times that I've been like, you know, sitting on, uh, you know, sitting outside of West Twelfth Street, mm-hmm. uh, chain smoking, and like practically in tears yeah. because I'm just like, oh my god, like I have to write a book yeah. and run a business. Yeah, this is insane. You know, and um, it is. It's insane. It full stop is. Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, so, uh, you know, I I'm really excited about the book, though. I'm excited that it's almost done. Um, it's out in October of this year. Are you allowed to talk about okay uh, what it's called? What's yeah. The name. So it's called Butcher and Beast. Okay. Um, and it is really exciting for me because it is kind of this. Um, it's this book that's really going to 
bring readers into our world. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm really excited because I, I feel like a lot of our, our regular diners and when you come to the Beatrice, you you get sucked into this beautiful world and yeah. you don't know what time it is. You don't know what it's day it is. Narnia. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It's Narnia. Exactly it is. And, um, you know, so when you come and eat with us, you experience all of that. And for me, you know, I was like, well, there's people that might not ever get to come eat here, mm -hmm. but I want to draw them into this world. Yeah. So um, so it's really exciting. Johnny Miller, who oh, is just brilliant, yeah. uh, shot the book. Um, and, you know, and what we did, which is really cool, is we shot the entire book in Polaroid. Yes. It's never been done before. I'm so excited about it. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, so it is recipes that are all from the restaurant. It's stories from the restaurant. It's stories, you know, from my family and how I grew up and you know all of all of like the gritty backstories that mm -hmm. nobody ever gets to hear um, that's what this book is and that's what's really exciting for me because when I really got into the meat of writing it mm -hmm. and said okay I guess I'm on contract I guess I have to do this yes. um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah. you do that or it gets pushed back to another season exactly. and then it doesn't come out yeah. till like 2020 exactly. or 2021 and, yeah. Yeah. and um, but you know so I sat I sat in my office and I have this like huge library of cookbooks in my office mm -hmm. and I sat in my office and I started flipping through all these cookbooks yes. and I was like okay you know what do I want my book to be what do I want it to say and I started flipping through all these cookbooks and it's like very much this like shiny lovely version yeah. <laughs> of what you know that restaurant or that whole idea is and I realized then I was like yeah but that's not here yeah like you know the Beatrice is gritty it mm -hmm. is um, provocative. It is like violently beautiful and yeah. primal. And it's like Studio Fi Studio 54, you know, meets um, meets this like old school chop house, meets you don't even know what's going on because the dining room is so crazy yeah. and the food is, it is, you know, so different. Um and I wanted to bring readers into that world and I wanted to really tell the truth mm -hmm. about what it is like day to day running that restaurant. I mean, there's, there's fur coats and carcasses. There are. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. So Kat actually, you know, you came in mm -hmm. and uh, was kind enough to come in and do a portrait for my book, was, which I was so excited. It was yeah. It was so fun. And, um, and I was really, I, I brought people in to do portraits for my book. Um, that had been really important to me throughout, you know, the the purchasing of the restaurant to the revitalization of this restaurant. And they were all people that I really love and, and are important to us. And you were one of them. And it was such an honor to have you in. And and, and it is crazy in there. It's, it's crazy. I, so the, my thing, I was wearing a silver dress, sitting up on the bar, <laughs> surrounded by half half drunk um glasses of champagne with yeah. like a half eaten burger yeah there. we were gonna pose but uh, like i picked the bottle up and just sort of swig front and we're like oh well that's the shot yeah one shot it was perfect and i believe um uh justin and uh justin chapel and jordana rothman yep. from food and wine had had come in and i believe there was an animal well <laughs> so it was actually yes so there was i was just gonna get to that so um danielle balud is uh you know somebody who i just love and admire i think he's just a gem and um so i had called him and i said you know chef will you come in for a portrait i'd love to have you and he said, absolutely, I'll, I'll be back in town, I'll come in. Um, and so Jordana Rothman and Justin Chapel were in and they were doing their portrait. And uh, Danielle walks in and he just walks into the, into the front entrance of the restaurant and then he looks to his right. In the bar, there's a 250-pound buck being skinned on the tables in the bar. And he just looked at it and he goes, really? <laughs> He's like, is this for the book? And we were like, no, it's for service. <laughs> like, it's going in pies. <laughs> yep. So it was, yeah, it was, uh, I, I was sitting there and I was like, oh my God, chef thinks I'm crazy. He thinks I'm so crazy. <laughs> no, um, he thinks you're a <laughs> But yeah, that's, that's a typical day at our restaurant. Yeah. You know, it's a typical day. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to see this represented. And now that I have you in my feelings dungeon, <laughs> as 
we, we sort of made a joke when I started um, this this job, which at this point is is, is still really new. Um, Ray Isle had said like, okay, so you're senior editor of what? And I was like, feelings. <laughs> um, you and I uh, have an ongoing text conversation and we talk about how the hell we're both workaholics. Yeah. How do we take care of ourselves yeah. during that? While you're writing a, a, a book, it yeah. is so incredibly difficult because everything it once it's in print it's just there it is yeah it's writing on it and you're still trying to have a day job at the time mm -hmm. it's exhausting and also if you are writing stories about yourself and your life and all this stuff mm -hmm. you have to go to a pretty if you're going to be honest you have to go to a dark place exactly a super a hundred percent yeah painful yeah and and so much goes into it and yeah. I think a lot of chefs who take this on don't realize that then again a lot of chefs don't put you know, it might be recipes. There are a yeah. million different kinds of, uh, of things. How did you take care of yourself while you were writing your book? Um, I disappeared a lot. Yeah. Um, I disappeared a lot. I would, uh, instant, you know, I mean, I do it even now. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I disappeared a lot for, you know, a period of like two to three days. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just hop on a plane and I would go to Paris. Mm -hmm. And I would just disappear. And it was one of those things where it was like, you know, everybody needed something from me at the restaurant. Yeah. And they were like, you know, we need this, we need this, we need this. And then, you know, my, um, you know, my managers would need something and my agents would need something. And I was just felt like I was being pulled in a million directions. And then, you know, the people at Clarkson would need something yeah. and I would just be like, okay. So I would literally, I, that's kind of become this routine that I have now where, um, you know, I will, through the process of like writing this book and like, yeah, it, it definitely is going to like a very dark place because you're pulling out all of these emotions. And the book that we've written um, is very raw. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's raw and it's truthful and it's, you know, not this like everything's great and shiny. Yeah. It's like, no, this is it. This is, this is real. It's and the industry hard is hard. damn business. Yeah. And that's what I really tried to convey in that book was this is a hard industry. It's not for everybody. It's yeah. not for the faint of heart. And that's okay. You know? Yeah. Um, and so while I was writing it, I, you know, I would go through these spurts where I would, I would write a bunch and I would be really like emotionally and creatively fatigued. Um, so I'd just hop on a plane and I would go to Paris for like one night. Wow. Yeah, I would, I would, I would <laughs> okay. leave, I would leave on a Saturday night. Yep. I would take a red eye, I would land on Sunday, you know, in the afternoon, I would, literally go to one dinner I would take a nap mm -hmm. and then I would go to a second dinner I would go to bed I would go shopping and like mm -hmm. out to lunch the whole next day and then I would go straight to the airport and I'd hop on a plane back to New York and that just having that like 30 hours yeah. just to myself to like decompress and not be in New York and be like and I would turn off my phones yeah. and I would just be completely unreachable like that really was like the best self-care that I could have ever done and you're good at being on planes I am. I fall asleep anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah. What is your what is your plane routine? Uh, so I always try to do red eye, so I can just like you know have a full day in New York mm -hmm. and then like get on a plane. But my plane routine is uh, I get on a plane, I um, have half a glass of champagne, a giant <laughs> bottle of water, and then I just knock out. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. enviable. I can't sleep on planes. Yeah, no, I, I, if anybody that knows me, it's like I get in an Uber, even if the Uber is 10 minutes, it's a 10 minute nap because I don't sleep a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't sleep a lot. My day starts really early. It ends really late. So mm -hmm. I'm all about the, the quick naps in between. So a thing I, I, I know about you and that I've come to realize about you is you are in the long game of this. Mm -hmm. You know that you bought a restaurant with a history and you know that you were the steward of it. You were doing this book as a document of, of this time and this vision. Light question here, what do you want your legacy to be for the industry? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good one, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've said this time and time again, but... Um, you know, I I think that what my legacy will be um, at the end of the day, what would be the most meaningful to me um, is where everybody in my restaurant today ends up in 10 years. Yeah. Um, and that's what really matters for me um, is I have 
this insane amount of talent that's housed under the roof at 285 West 12th Street. I mean, insane amount. And for me, it won't matter how many cookbooks I write. It won't matter what we do. Um, you know, it will matter where they all end up. And that is, and, and the difference that they make in our industry. Um, that is what's really important for me um, is, is, you know, cultivating the next generation of restaurant professionals. And that's what's really important. Um, and, you know, and personally, it's like, I love that we're doing techniques that nobody else has done. I love that we're doing, you know, that every year we release something different. I love that every autumn, you know, the industry looks to us and they say, okay, what insane thing is she doing <laughs> this autumn? You know, like that makes me really happy, yeah. you know, um, especially in terms of meat and dry aging techniques. Um, that's really exciting for me. But, you know, that at the end of the day, that's not going to matter. It's going to matter where my guys are in 10 years. I think that is a gorgeous place to wrap up this part <laughs> of it. And now I'm going to ask you the five yes. questions. What is your comfort food? Oh, okay. Uh, so, I, well, I have a couple things. Um, chicken nuggets. Oh, like I straight know. up McDee's? Yeah, <gasps> like McDee's and some champagne. I'm good. Oh, yeah, What's 100%. your sauce with that? Sweet and sour, obviously. <laughs> <Cat>. <laughs> <Hello>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, every year for my birthday, um, my cousin brings me, she's the best. She knows me this well. She brings me um, 20 piece chicken McNuggets, vintage Dom Perignon, pack of Marlboro Reds. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> the Karen beating of Angie Mar. Yeah. Oh my God, I love that. What is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Oh God, so many. Um, so, you know, I was, uh, I was just at Per Se on Sunday and, um, you know, every time I, every time I go there, so my Sunday routine is, is, you know, sometimes I stay home, sometimes I don't, but when I do go out, I actually go and I, I sit in the dining or not in the dining room, but on, on the sofa in Per Se. And yeah. a lot of times I go there by myself. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Because I just like, you know, it's like one of those things where it was like, you go there, you sit on this lovely sofa, you have a couple bites, have a glass of champagne, and it's just you overlook the park, and it's really nice. And um, so I was just there on Sunday with uh, some of the ladies that work with me, and, um, you know, the egg custard there is insane. And the first time I had it, uh, it made me cry because it was so beautiful. And, um, you know, because I had, like, I had it last time that I was there, and so they made me an omelet. It was an omelet. I can't even no, it was so beautiful. It was an omelet with truffles, and it was custardy, and they put it in front of me, and they paired it with sherry, and I, you know, it's one of those things, like, one bite, and you get angry. Like, yeah. I was angry. I was, yep. I was so angry that I didn't make it. You know what I mean? I was just like, God, you guys, I'm so angry right now. Um, but I, I got so emotional over that omelet. And it's the simple things, right? It's the simple things. And, and I find that as a chef, as a creative, the more complicated things that I cook, the more simple things that I crave. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody can cook me an omelet and bring me to tears, like... That's a that's a really good thing. Oh my gosh. I, I cried there having um the oysters and pearls. Yeah. It's just it's I mean it's a beautiful dish. Yeah. Is it it's oysters and pearls, right? Oysters yeah. and pearls. What is the last meal that somebody made for you at their house? Oh, nobody cooks for me. That's the thing. <laughs> nobody cooks for me. <laughs> yeah. I I will cook for okay, you. Okay, I will come over and you can cook for me. I will yeah. happily cook for you. Um cuz I it would be my jo I love cooking for chefs. Yeah. Actually, it makes me really happy because like Amazing. nobody's expect I like I know the things I'm good at. It's, yeah. It's just really fun and also I know nobody cooks for you. No, <laughs> nobody. It's so funny. I think that like I think that's a common thread amongst uh chefs like nobody wants to ever cook for us, you know. <laughs> Um, which ironically is what we always want. Right. We just want to be cooked for. I want to make you my collard greens. I'm very okay, proud of that. Okay, I love that. that. 
Um, who is the living musician for whom you would want to cook and what would you cook for them? And by the way, this question is like using the secret to draw this person to you. Oh God. Who is it? <laughs> That's a really good question. Everybody gets hung up on this question. I mean, I'm kind of digging Cardi B right now. <gasps> what would you yeah. cook for Cardi B? I think I would have to give her a really good steak. Oh. Yeah. I think we'd have to like change Cardi's world and like give her, give her some really good dried beef. Cardi B. If you are listening, <laughs> go to the Beatrice. We put this in the universe. The Ca Cardi Beatrice. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I just want to be a fly on the wall. And yeah, right. Happening. I think this should be her new favorite restaurant. I know. I love it. Um, <laughs> last question. You have five minutes for self care. What do you do? Um, five minutes for self care. I, I am very quiet. Um, I would actually. I like to take those five minutes, and just be present. Um, and for me, it is one of those things that I, you know, I'm making decisions all the time and talking to people all the time. So for me to get five minutes alone and to just like have a cup of tea and just be very present with myself, um, that's something that it makes all the difference. I think that is so lovely. Angie Marr, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Kat. And y'all... Buy the book in October. <laughs> o what is the pub date? October 1st. October yeah, 1st. October 1st. Do that. <laughs> Get yourself in there to the Beatrice Inn. Experience the mad magical world of Angie Marr. And yes, Cardi B, I'm talking to you. <laughs>